Prevention is the key to a healthy life. That's why Gunderson Health encourages you to learn about vaccines and how they can help you and your loved ones stay healthy. Vaccines protect against preventable diseases and viruses by boosting your body's defenses. Visit GundersonHealthFacts.com to learn more. We reconnected with Michael Perry. We chatted about the themes of his book, 40 Acres Deep. We got into the author's hesitation with the book, a winter shed collapse that inspired it, and the agricultural mental health movement that touches on depression and anxiety. Catch Michael Perry live at the Pump House Regional Arts Center. You can find more conversations on our website, lacrosselocal.com. I'm Amy. And I'm Brent. And this is Lacrosse Local. So we're out on the farm now. We're raising some chickens and pigs. We're also trying to get some beef. I started fencing last year to get beef. I didn't quite get finished. And so what I raised last year was theoretical beef. <laughs> I like theoretical beef. Uh, they're easy to work with. And, you know, all you got to do is brag about them. You don't actually have to feed them. That's nice. So last time we connected, about a year ago, we chatted about your early experiences, you know, your path to memoirs, your connection with the Tent Show Radio, which it seems like you have a ton of new music up there now. But you were also at that time performing at the Pump House Region Arts Center, and now you're coming back the same time. So it's been a year. What's up? <laughs> I'm excited about coming back, man. The last time I was there, the place was jammed, and it's it's a great room, too. I, when I do my live events, I do quite a bit of humor, and there's nothing like uh, a room packed full of people to get people to laugh. There's sure. something about the closeness of it, and, and that just was a, a great venue, so I'm looking forward to coming back. Since then, just been hustling. I was raised by farmers and loggers and truckers and self-employed people. And I always, you know, people say, are you a writer? I go, well, I'm a writer, but mostly I'm self-employed. <laughs> and I've been saying always that for the last several years, people ask me what my inspiration is, what, what keeps me going. And I say, well, I, I got two daughters. I got one, one's in braces and one's in college. <laughs> But now the one is out of college and the other one is out of her braces, but still out there hustling. Since the pump house, I had another book come out. I wrote a novella called 40 Acres Deep. And yeah. I was pretty nervous about that book just because it's a real departure from what I usually do. It's it's an unrelentingly heavy book. It's dark. It started when I was a couple of winters back. I was trying to save my pole barns. We were getting so much snow that bar barns were collapsing all over and so I was up in the middle of the night trying to save mine and I was yanking a torpedo heater through the drifts and I was cussing and certainly sweating and worried I was going to lose my sheds. And then all of a sudden it just hit me in, in the middle of the night there like, dude, you're a, you're a self-employed writer with a couple of sheds full of junk. If, if they fall down, that's, that's all you're going to lose. Uh, whereas I had neighbors who were losing cattle and losing their livelihoods and uh, fighting to save both those things. And so that planted the seed of an idea. And then also there was a, this is right around the time, a, a couple of years back when a lot of us got to spend time just all alone Sure, yeah. and it was, it was kind of dark. And so I just went with that. And then I wrote this book about a farmer trying to, it, it's kind of about a farmer trying to hang on to his farm, but more it's, it's a reflection of what all of us are dealing with, just a shifting, changing world and how do we face it and how do we operate in a, in an environment that maybe we don't understand anymore and all the things we learned and, and, and we're taught maybe don't apply. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just went with that. And, and the reason I was trepidatious about doing it is because it is so different. I do a lot of humor. I do personal memoir and this was not only dark, but it's, it's fiction. It's a novella. It's a format, a short, you know, which is a longer than a short story, shorter than a novel. It's not the most popular format in this day and age. And then I sent it to my agent in New York and she does not blow smoke nor sunshine to me. She tells me the truth. And when she read it, she said, this is some of the best writing you've done in 20 years, mm. but I don't think that we're going to be able to get any of the publishers to bite. And I kind of expected that. And so what I thought is, you know what, I'm just going to go back to my DIY days and, and do it myself. And, and we pu published it with our own little imprint. And man, I just, I'm so glad I did do it because mm -hmm. it's in its second printing now. It's sold thousands of copies. Um, I'm having conversations with farmers, with husbands, with, uh, I get letters and emails from wives and farm wives and just readers in general. 
and it's connecting with people. It's quiet. Don't get me wrong. We're not, I'm still driving a 2002 Toyota van to gigs, nice. but it, it has connected in a way that uh, I hoped it might. I would say also, I'm talking about the darkness of it, but it's also a book where I just wanted, there were, th- there were scenes I wanted to write. I wanted to write about what it's like to look out on a full moon night and see deer flowing across the lunar landscape. I wanted to write about what it's like to step out on a still hoarfrost morning and try to capture that. And I really let myself dive deep into that stuff. So it's a mix of me just trying to be the best writer I can, but also trying to tell a story. And it's led to, I I just did an event where I was on a panel for farmers and mental health and just picked, yeah, I'm sorry, man, I I spent a lot of time alone and I don't, (laughs) I don't talk much. And then once, (laughs) once I get started, I have a hard time shutting down. So go ahead. It's your, it's your job. So, I mean, I could just let you go (laughs) in about five minutes. We could turn this off. It'll be perfect. I don't even have to edit it. No, but I mean, I, that was one thing I was surprised, which it reminded me of just the agricultural mental health movement, which I think you were going to go down that path. I mean, it's just my little bit of digging into it. And I've heard about it in, in years past. It's just, it's scary in a sense. It's a tough, tough time. And, you know, it, we're seeing it everywhere. I have young daughters and I've watched them come through their teen years. And on the one hand, the good news is we're talking about this stuff in ways we never have before. The uneasy news is it seems like we need to talk about this stuff more than we ever have before. And I'm not the expert. I'm not going to get into all the reasons why, but there is a growing awareness, but man, we need it. I wrote a book called Montaigne and Barn Boots, which was another book that was a departure for me because I wrote about stuff in there that I've never written about before. And it's about French philosophy, but it's also about forgetfulness and chickens and whatever came along (laughs) while I was writing it. But in there, I wrote about uh, anxiety and panic attacks and I uh, talked about disclosing to my brother that I had been through a period of that and him just all of a sudden looking at me in a way I'd never seen him look at me before and then starting to tell me about his panic attacks and anxiety. And dude's a logger and he could take either one of us with one sure. hand tied his back and I just think that was a moment where I, it helped me realize that, yeah, man, this stuff is everywhere. And, and farming has its own special set of worries and concerns, and it attracts a certain sort of person, too, male or female. So, yeah, I've, I've definitely talked to some farmers as a result of this book. It also just seems like it's kind of interwoven in the story. You talk about the hesitation of writing the book but also comparing the plight of your own collapsing sheds where in some ways with depression or anxiety, in some ways you feel like you don't, I guess you don't earn it, not earn it, but you don't deserve it. But you feel like, why am I this way when I don't have as many issues as other people starting to compare yourself in a sense? I always joke because of where I come from, because of my background, if you can't stack it or stack with it, it don't count. (laughs) <laughs> and a stack of books don't count either. And I'm slowly overcoming that over time. I work for a living. I just happen to have nice, soft hands. My brothers uh, like to gently tease me about that. I'm always in my own work. I'm always overcoming the idea that if I stopped writing books tomorrow, the world would not notice. But I also, you're right, it's a smart parallel to draw that there are times when I'm immobilized by depression or anxiety. And Part of what's interesting about that is the anger you feel at yourself, because I can look all around me and go, dude, I got to have a lovely house. Uh, Okay, that's a lie. I have a horrible (laughs) house. It's falling apart. There's corrugated tin on the roof, but I have a wonderful space here. I'm sitting in my room above the office. I'm looking at the back 40. I've got cars that run and I've got food in the fridge. So yeah, it's, it's tough sometimes. And I have a fulfilling, unanticipated, wonderful career where I get to go around and tell people stories. And don't get me wrong, I'm happy most of the time. And one of the things in the Montaigne book, I wrote about that. One of the things that I've worked on for years is, is being able to be grateful, even when you're unhappy, even when you are in the grip of that, as I call it, the black dog. I never lose track of the fact that, yeah, things don't feel great, but I'm still grateful for the life I've been given. The final thing I'd say is that I'm also very careful when I have these discussions to acknowledge that my depression, my anxiety goes has all my life only ever gone to a certain level. And I understand that there are people facing things far more difficult, not just situationally, but psycho- psychologically. So 
I want to make sure I don't sound like I'm just toughing it out because that's <laughs> kind of what we're fighting is that attitude. Exactly. So in terms of like how you kind of lay out this book for a live presentation, which would be September 22nd at the Pump House, people will get to hear this book, this upcoming show on the cross, right? Man, I didn't even get started on all the stories that I've got when I was there the last time. And I do do set lists. So I'll, you know, the, I do repeat a few stories now and then. I've got a couple of stories I've probably told a thousand times where people tell me they, they like to hear them again. But yeah, I, I have a set list. So I'll check that and I'll do some new stories and different stories. And then the thing I do with a book like this is I'll try to read some of the, what I hope are the more artful parts, try and share a little bit of that. I love a, a live performance that that has some texture that that takes you up and down and a little bit of roller coaster effect. And nothing makes a, a story funnier than having something really bracing right before it. And then the last thing I'd say is that I actually did sneak some humor. I keep talking about how dark this book is, but it is my opinion that the American literary scene has completely neglected the topic of the torpedo heater. And my guy in this book, he's got two torpedo heaters. And I have a little section I do at live events about torpedo heaters that has so far always gotten a, a nice laugh. From way back in the day when I first Population 45 came out and I started doing book tours and I was doing radio interviews, I just started studying my or taking my books and breaking them down into little pieces so that if I was on live radio and they had a hard break and the guy goes, we got 45 seconds. Why don't you read us something from the book? I actually had in my book 45 second break pieces huh. marked out. And so I learned a long time ago to take a larger work and break it down in such a way that you can you can do a little flow and you can move from the serious to the beautiful to the goofy and give people a little taste without just reading at them. I'm a fan of the Ten Show Radio. It seems like you're just getting a lot of just interesting artists coming through that place. I have to, you know, in this case, defer and and give honor to Terry up there at the big top. She does the booking. I have nothing to do with the booking. <laughs> I do occasionally have people say, hey, we want to be on the, we want to play the tent. How can you get us in there? That place, and I, I always say, I'm a guest. I'm a guest when I perform up there. I'm a guest when I pull up to the microphone to do the radio show. That all started with people long before me. That place has got a deep, deep history. And I know some of the people who started that place. And so I always operate with a certain amount of deference. I also acknowledge that it's an amazing place to see a show. The Waylon Jenny, Jennies were up there the other uh, day, and they had 1,500 people spilling out of that place wow. and into the grass. And, and yet, there's no getting around the fact that it's out of the way. Yeah. And so they really, like any venue in this day and age, are working hard to figure out, you know, how do we forge ahead into the future and how can we bring in a wide range of acts and yet still stay true to the idea that this is a tent in the woods in northern Wisconsin. I would say I take my hat off, but I can't because I get clamped on with these headphones. But uh, I do <laughs> I do figuratively take my hat off to the crew up there that that is booking a, a real interesting slate of artists. You seem, like you said, to have any number of projects in the works. So what's coming up out of some of those things? What are you excited for in the next six months? Well, I'm usually kind of off around to 16 different things, as you've already seen. But in this case, I'm going to tell you the minute that I'm done with this interview, I have two books that are way overdue, not because I'm lazy, <laughs> not because uh, I have uh, been in communication with my editors, but I have one book uh, about fathers and daughters that... Oh. Uh, is so far overdue that I promised my editor that I would turn it in on October 1st. And so it's about 70% there. I got to hustle, uh, but that is uh, the main thing I'm going to do is get that turned in. So hopefully that book can come out next year. And then I, the minute I finish that, I'm going to finish the uh, sequel to a book I called, wrote called The Scavengers. And that one too is 70 or 80% done but it's been 70 or 80 percent done so long that i just quit talking about it in public <laughs> gonna do that and then i'm just on the road um you know if you go to sneezingcow.com we have an events page the other thing that i really push for gently and respectfully but in this day and age of social media i do put goofy stuff on social media and and try to be a little bit entertained in that way but 
if you really want to know, I'll have people say, oh, you were in lacrosse. And I wish I'd have known that because I live in lacrosse. And go, well, there's an old fashioned thing on our website at sneezingcow.com called the mailing list. Hmm. And if you're willing to just give us your email and your zip code, we won't we won't bug you. You'll get occasional emails from me. You'll hear when I have a new book, but you will hear we do a 70 mile radius of lacrosse. So you would know that I'm going to be at the pump house. So and the thing about that old fashioned mailing list we love is and you know this because you you work with work with this stuff social media platforms are, are fabulous but things change uh, at the sure. whim of a billionaire and so we can lose track of you on social media so that that's the best way to find out what i'm doing next is to be on that mailing list well this is awesome it seems like an important story to tell so you'll be at pump house regional arts center september 22nd sharing your stories in the new book 40 acres deep i really appreciate you taking the time I appreciate having the time and I will, I will sign off here and get to type and get back to work. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Lacrosse Local Podcast is a production of River Travel Media. Do you have an interview idea you'd like to share with us? Message us on Facebook at Lacrosse Local. Find out more about us at lacrosselocal.com. And you can subscribe to the Lacrosse Local Podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you like us, rate us five stars. We appreciate it.